what we really mean by calling it that, um, aside from investigating the possibility of finding somebody called Bellwether who might like to sponsor it, um, is that it translates into the modern, modern idiom as an entity, entity that serves to create or influence trends and predict future events. So that is absolutely um, makes Professor Timothy Wu of Columbia Law School um, the kind of perfect speaker for such a lecture th series. Um, Timothy is a, a difficult person to introduce because of the really great range and depth of his thinking and a career which has been described as both peculiar um, and aggressively non-linear. Um, so I'll just pick out a few, um, a few atoms, um, a, a, atoms of it. Um, Professor Wu trained as a biochemist and then as a lawyer. He was a law clerk to a Supreme Court Justice, um, Justice Stephen Breyer. He served as senior advisor to the Federal Trade Commission as a fellow at Google and has worked for Riverstone Networks in the te telecommunications industry. But where his influence and reach is really evident is in his work as an academic, a policy advisor, and a writer. A writer for the Wall Street Journal and the New Yorker, um, but actually um, we discovered the winner of two awards for travel writing. <laughs> so that really is um, <laughs> reach in every sense of the word. Um, a paper in 2003 led him to being acknowledged as the divisor of the term network neutrality, which led to his invitation in 2006 to join the Federal Communications Commission to help draft the first network neutrality rules relating to a merger of AT&T and Bell South. His paper proposing um, a rule of regulation for mobile phone networks was adopted by the FCC and has been credited by Business Week and many others with providing the intellectual framework that inspired Google's mobile phone strategy. In 2006, Tim was named as one of Scientific American's 50 People of the Year and in 2013 as one of America's 100 Most Influential Lawyers by the National Law Journal. Uh, Tim has been to the Oxford Internet Institute before. He came in 2011 to discuss his book, The Master Switch, um, as part of the UK launch. That book was named as one of the best books of 2010 by the New Yorker magazine and by Fortune magazine, among others. As you can imagine, it was full then, and it's pretty full now. Um, so we're really pleased to have Tim back in Oxford. This time um, he's here as part of the Darendorf programme for the study of freedom at St Anthony's College. Um, and this, uh, this lecture is, part of, uh, the free, is, is partly sponsored by the free speech debate project of the Darendorf programme. Um, and I've been advised by its uh, director, Timothy Garten-Ash, that um, you must all visit freespeech.com. Oh gosh, freespeechdebate.com, but the lovely internet will sort it out. Um, <laughs> so we're very grateful to the programme and to St Anthony's College for making this evening happen and allowing us another chance um, to listen to Tim speak. So I'm delighted to welcome you to our speaker. He's going to speak um, on the subject of the scarcity of human attention which is, um, I'm sure, a subject very close to all of our hearts. Um, so I'll hand over to you. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you for the... Uh, thanks for the, the generous introduction. You know, I've decided um, uh, I, I can't give anyone career advice anymore because it's... <laughs> you know, my career is so random that I would... It would it's like stumbling around, like stumbling through a forest or something. And, so I, I don't feel qualified, but thank you. It was a very, very generous introduction. So what I'm talking about uh, today is uh, my new book, um, which is uh, not finished. In fact, I, I believe I've been entered in the audience waiting for a, a manuscript at some point. Uh, but it is on the, so you're seeing somewhat of a, a midway uh, uh, point. Uh, the topic, uh, the, the title of the book is Your Attention, Please. And the topic of the book is Human Attention and Whether uh, We Ought Think of human attention as a scarce resource uh, that we has been learned uh, how to harvest, and um, and uh, the book basically uh, traces the the history uh, of the harvesting of human attention over the last uh, hundred years or so. But I'm going to start before I get to um, uh, more of the subject with a, a little story. Um, I want to return to about a hundred uh, years ago and tell you about a lawyer. 
um, uh, who was uh, in his late 20s and had been practicing for some time. And uh, like many attorneys, his um, actual interest was not law. He'd gone to law school because he thought it seemed a sensible thing. His parents had recommended it. But he didn't, you know, he did his work and he was perfectly good at it. But like many lawyers, it wasn't really his passion. What he wanted to do was to be an author. His, he thought he could be a writer. And um, he had tried uh, various uh, little snippets of writing, but he had never really been able to get it together. Never finished a story. Always just dabbled. And I don't know, many, many of you maybe have hobbies. You fancy you're going to write a movie script or something. And you just did dabble a little. It's hard to get finished. So um, one day, um, in my notes I have the real day, but I, I, it's, uh, I think Sept September, um, he sat down at 10 PM in the evening. In front, and he had a, a typewriter. And he, and he started to type. And he typed, and he typed, and he typed. And uh, he was writing in his writing. And he did not leave the seat for eight hours. And the entire time, he wrote, and he wrote, and he wrote. And he wrote his first story. And this is the, uh, this is the, the book it became right here, uh, Franz Kafka's da Das Ertal, which was written in a single sitting, eight hours of uh, complete absorption in his project. And uh, he wrote about it later in his diary. In, in, uh, words I'm going to have to paraphrase, but he, he, he wrote that while writing this, he said, this is the only way to write. He said, I was utterly engrossed. It was like sailing over water, like flying. The words were coming out just endlessly. And so this was, this was his um, experience. Um, I'm going to turn to a, a, another writer. Uh, whoops, wrong computer. Uh, this is uh, a movie version of this writer. His name is Jack Kerouac. Uh, he also uh, wrote a book over a very intense period of time. He uh, prepared a special technology. Actually, this, this uh, photo is wrong. He bought uh, these enormous sheets of paper, and he taped them all together to make a giant, what he called the scroll. And I don't know how long the scroll was, but maybe I think it was 1,000 feet long or something like that. And he wound them into his typewriter. And he decided he was going to write his book all in one sitting. Uh, and he sat there, and I don't think he sat there all in one sitting, but he just sat there for, I think it was about three weeks, typing and typing and typing. And when he was done, he'd completed the entire novel uh, on, on the road. Uh, became his most famous uh, book. He wrote it without paragraph breaks, no real punctuation, anything, just no page breaks, just wrote the whole thing. Um, a third story of this genre uh, is a story of the uh, creation of the famous video game Breakout, uh, which was an idea uh, that Atari, some of you are maybe video game people, know the company Atari. They had the idea uh, in the 70s that they needed a following act to Pong, which had been a big hit. And so they came out with this idea of, uh, uh, but they needed someone to write it. And so they gave a young programmer the job, kind of programmer, businessman, whose name was Steve Jobs. Um, now Jobs very clever a fellow, because what, and they said he had, um, uh, I think, three or two, two days to write the game. Now, most video games now take uh, years to make, but he, two days is what he was given. Now, what Jobs, uh, I'm not quite sure in all details why it was so rushed to schedule. Jobs knew one thing. He uh, knew he wasn't that good <laughs> at programming, and so he went and found another fellow, Steve Wozniak, who was his friend, worked at Hewlett Packard. They worked together. Now, at this point, they had to create this game not the way we have computers now, where you type in the code. They were actually had to solder. They had to think of the game and then solder the wires together to make a game that played. If you can sort of imagine, the, the, they had to think about, well, what will make this game work? And then solder all the wires together on these chipsets to make them work. Um, uh, they did it. They didn't sleep for two days and managed to complete Breakout in about 48 hours. Now it's a great video game uh, classic. Um, so I bring up these uh, stories for, for, for two reasons as an introduction to my book. First of all, it is to point out, um, it's not to recommend this is a good way to create and complete a project, but it is to show just what human beings are capable of when they're in states of incredibly exalted, focused attention. Sometimes they're called flow states. Um, and maybe some of you in the audience have had this experience, maybe during final exams or something, where it just seems you enter a different kind of uh, type of focus or ability where you can uh, concentrate and actually uh, do this task that you're, you're interested in doing. Uh, and I don't think that's the only form of attention, and my book is not only about that, but it's one of the most uh, valuable forms. And 
when uh, you, people are in that state, in almost a sense, they can move mountains. They can do things that seem almost miraculous. The second reason I bring up that story, or these three stories, is to ask whether in our times it would actually be easier or harder to have completed these tasks. So on the one hand, I think it might have been easier in some ways. Um, take breakout. We have more advanced uh, programming tools nowadays, better languages, libraries, and so forth. Uh, if we think about Kafka or Kerouac, we have word processors. They correct our spelling, correct your grammar. They format things as you write. Um, so all kinds of handy things like that. But I am tempted to think that other ways it must have, might have been a lot harder nowadays. I imagine Kafka sitting down. He's an attorney, begins to write his story. And suddenly he gets an email from his uh, senior partner or something, which needs to be tended with. Or maybe he just decides, I'm getting sick of the story. Maybe I'll go on Facebook for a little while, check that out, for a, see how that's doing. Maybe Kerouac starts uh, writing here, and then all of a sudden decides his Twitter feed needs some writing. Or maybe he's going to blog a little bit. Hey, I'm going to write a book in one sitting. And he starts writing the blog about the book he's going to write or so forth. And I don't know about you, but I've often had this uh, uh, feeling uh, these days, where sometimes you sort of sit down at your computer, you have one goal, maybe. I don't know if you've had this. And then um, three hours later, you're like, what just happened? Where was I? <laughs> maybe not three, but an hour just goes by, and you're like, well, I guess I did answer some emails or do some Twitter posts or do some things. And maybe you're more disciplined than I am. If so, I, I uh, respect that. Um, but I think we live in an age, and I think if uh, people came to our age, they would be surprised how often one of the aspects of our times are constant demands for tiny little pieces of your attention, just a little bit, you know, just check this thing out for a while, we need you to read this email. And in a way that's not, um, that is always been there in public spheres, obviously, you walk down the street, even in medieval times, maybe come try out this um, mead or something, I don't know. <laughs> come see the jousting tournament. Uh, but you know, a little bit like that. But you know, e even in, in our uh, private spaces, in our offices, everywhere, we sort of have little demands for attention, constant little grabs for attention. And one of the reasons I decided to write this book is to try and understand where this came from. Why so many uh, companies and so many, uh, not only companies, companies, government, almost everyone, um, sees it as a critical part of their mission to try to ch uh, harvest or, or uh, grab hold of some human attention, and why we are in a state as citizens where we're almost constantly being asked to sort of donate a little attention here, donate a little attention there. How did this uh, uh, come to be? I'll back this up with the, the conceit of the book. The idea of the book is that uh, roughly as more and more resources um, or more and more things in our life become relatively uh, uh, non-scarce or surplus. As we have enough food, uh, we have enough uh, leisure, have clothing. I, my clothing's a little bit, this uh, was not planned, although <laughs> Tim, uh, Timothy said it was uh, stylish, so thanks for that. Um, you know, we have, we sort of, sort of the necessities of life. Uh, the things that are scarce uh, tend to become more valuable, and one of the things that is undeniably scarce, that you cannot uh, really enlarge the supply of, is the amount of human uh, attention we have, being is that it's related to time. Uh, when you think about it, uh, 168 is an important number. That's the number of hours there are in a single week. Uh, and no matter who you are, if you're rich or you're poor, uh, man, woman, child, you cannot increase that number. <laughs> And within that number, within that 168 hours, um, your brain is capable of processing a certain amount of information during that period. It also needs to sleep and do other things, but it, it only has a certain amount of processing power, um, some number of cycles, we might use the phrase, to use during that 168 hours. And this resource, um, in some ways, I think, is becoming maybe not the only a scarce resource, but one of the resources that uh, it seems everyone wants a hold of. Some of what um, that drives this interest for myself is um, uh, my experience in the tech industries, where and in the tech and entertainment industries, where almost the the 
human attention is the uh, uh, is what everyone is after, is what the, the business plan is. How do we get attention? How do we get this number of people spending this amount of time on our site? How do we get people to watch this program? How do we get people to read this thing? How do we get people to read this and forward it so more people read it? You know, whether it's at, at BuzzFeed or at Google or um, uh, even uh, 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 filmmakers or uh, anyone, there's this, uh, and as I said, a kind of giant uh, uh, battle or giant contest to try and uh, grab and harvest human attention. So where did this all uh, come from? Well, I'm going to walk you very briefly through uh, my book, which takes a, a trip mainly through the 20th century and proposes, um, again, with the conceit that uh, attention is an, a resource almost like oil whose value was discovered, um, fully discovered and harnessed in this century and talk you through some of the, the main developments in that story. So uh, my b belief is that um, while human attention has always been seen as somewhat valuable, particularly by religious uh, entities, that the institutional, scaled, um, almost professionalized uh, uh, techniques for harvesting it uh, began in the, the 20th century. And one of the areas I want to highlight is, uh, is World War I and the propaganda uh, efforts in that war, which to my mind were a demonstration of just how powerful uh, the harvesting of human attention could be if it was done in a systematic way using the methods of uh, mass uh, production. So I need to, to back up uh, just a little bit. So in um, the late 19th century, uh, you began to have an advertising industry, so a little bit before World War I, uh, that started to understand more things almost intuitively about how you would gain uh, attention from the, uh, the human brain. So let me uh, take you on a small diversion in some of the science of attention. This won't be a, a long lecture, but a, a small lecture. Uh, as soon as you start to study the science of human attention, of processing information, you pretty quickly learn that the brain's method for dealing with the world we are in is to ignore almost everything almost all of the time. This kind of explains why teaching is such a challenging job. Most, our brain is constructed to ignore, to filter, to keep out almost everything uh, that might uh, impose upon it. Now, why does it do that? The reason is that the brain has a limited uh, capacity, a limited information processing capacity. If it's exposed to too much information, it can stall, and you can feel it stalling. If you ever try to do a mathematical, let's say you try and multiply two numbers in your head, like 245 times 322, and you start to do it, and sometimes you just feel your brain as if it's, you're in the wrong gear and it's not working. You have to divide it into smaller problems. We have a limited amount of processing power. And the amount of information constantly coming at us through our, uh, uh, through our nerves is, is massive. Um, I have the exact uh, number in, in my notes. But it's uh, the number, amount of information just coming from the optic nerve is much larger than any of the broadband uh, connections in the center of the internet. It's, it's millions of bits uh, or trillions. I can't remember the order of magnitude, but some enormous uh, amount of uh, bits per second. And uh, if you did not have ways of filtering all the information coming through your optic nerves and also through your, uh, your sense of sense, uh, of touch, your sense of smell, and so forth, the brain would be overwhelmed. And so it's learned ways uh, to ignore almost anything. So the information is allocated or pay, it, it, uh, is paid to small pieces of information, and that can happen generally in one of two ways. Um, neuro, uh, neuro uh, scientists uh, describe this often as top-down or bottom-up attention uh, processes. So one way that information, um, and the way we think of it often, is that you decide, you choose. Uh, maybe you're, you're sitting here and you think, I'm going to listen to the stream, I'm going to focus, I'm going to hear uh, the voice uh, coming at me. If you stop for a second, you can change that. Um, for example, I encourage you just to think about your toes or your feet for a second. And you know, the moment before, you might have completely had no sense of what they were doing, but all of a sudden you realize, well, maybe they're hot or they're cold or 
maybe my socks are too tight or, you know, but you suddenly can, can feel and you can move the attention around as you need. You can feel if you try it, um, the, the, the back of your head. Uh, you can use your ears and listen. And, and so you can use your, uh, and this is called voluntary attention. You can allocate your attention voluntarily to different streams of information and um, uh, sometimes uh, keep it there. Um, there is another entire route for informational uh, decision making, which is involuntary. There are certain uh, stimuli to which you will pay attention to uh, no matter what. It is outside of your voluntary control. And scientists tend to describe these. Let me see if I can give an example. It's impossible not to pay attention to loud sounds, even though you might want, not want to. You, you, you will. Um, vibrant colors, high contrast, uh, all of these basic stimuli. Some learned stimuli, food, monsters, predator, sexual targets, these things grab the human attention almost without choice. And so the late 19th century, we see um, a, a development of the advertising industry where it starts to harness some of these tools. Um, prior to this, and I later versions will have another slide, posters were mostly just text. They'd say something like, you know, show tonight and so forth. Uh, the French uh, advertisers and artists late 19th century understood that they could harvest and I don't know if they said it this way, some of the involuntary pathways and capture things. If you look carefully at this, first of all, it, looks like it's, it almost looks like it's moving. The colors are a little not clear on this, but they're large blocks of colors. It's a sense of motion. Obviously, a sexy girl, half-dressed. Um, you almost imagine she's banding these symbols so it, you can imagine the sound. So they began to start to, to use these uh, techniques um, in advertising. But the one thing that was missing, well, the advertiser in the late 19th century had begun to understand uh, how you could gain attention through the posters. Uh, one thing was missing uh, were two. There was not a widespread acceptability for advertising. Many companies considered it a waste of money or time. Advertising was um, confined to certain industries. It wasn't widespread. And second of all, it lacked the scale. <laughs> that wasn't one of my tricks. <laughs> Did someone? <laughs> <laughs> I wish it had been. <laughs> I should have put that on, suddenly had like laser shoot out or something. Um, like, so uh, they hadn't reached the scale. And the scale and the systematic efforts to harvest human attention, I think, were pioneered by uh, uh, this country, uh, Britain, uh, and to some degree by the Americans during World War I. And uh, the reason I'd uh, suggest um, was the uh, problem that Britain faced in World War I, uh, having declared war on uh, Germany um, because of the invasion of Belgium and therefore uh, following its ultimatum, uh, Britain found itself in a position where it had an army that people estimate uh, between 60,000 and 200,000, depending on how you count the regulars and reserves, maybe up to half a million with all the reserves. Um, and the German army at the time had about 4.5 million. Uh, the German Imperial Army had 4.5. So Britain had a serious uh, problem. America, when it joined the war, had the same problem, no standing army. And so as opposed, conscription wasn't something that either country wanted to turn to at that point. Uh, and what both countries turned to were instead mass domestic propaganda campaigns. And when you look at these uh, campaigns, oh, this isn't, um, you can see that they uh, use many of the same uh, techniques. There's a sense of motion. So there are words, there's uh, vibrant colors, exciting images. Uh, the British and uh, the Americans uh, use almost every technique you can imagine. This particular poster where they have a terrifying monster. They have a uh, half-dressed woman and, um, of course, these uh, commands and exciting words all put uh, together. Um, some more of the uh, British propaganda, some of the first instances. <laughs> of what seems to me early versions of false advertising. Uh, what's so amazing about the British recruitment effort to me is that it kept succeeding and it ultimately resulted in about half of the uh, British male population joining uh, the army or other armed forces, even though within six months 
people knew what the casualty rates were. Even though they knew that joining the army meant uh, unlikely to be a, playing cricket all day, but a very high chance of being killed or uh, being seriously injured. People kept joining the army without any formal conscription program. And one of the things you read as uh, when you read carefully about the history of the advertising industry is that this incredible success um, of the British, uh, particularly, and the American uh, propaganda or advertising campaigns, the harvesting, the sort of sustained effort to keep this idea in people's mind that you should join the army, that that is the thing you should do, was picked up very, uh, was listened to very carefully and picked up by the advertising industries, both in Britain and in the United States, who in a sense pill, uh, filled the vacuum uh, in the 1920s, when you really see the growth of what we consider a modern advertising industry. There was some before, but the systematic, large-scale advertising firms, Madison Avenue and the uh, English and French equivalents, uh, began in the 1920s. And that's also when a lot of, um, same time, you see a lot of um, products becoming uh, mass-produced. And at the same time, you see companies that might have previously been very resistant to advertising, see it as sort of low class or unnecessary waste of money, begin to embrace uh, advertising. Uh, famously, of course, the um, cigarette industry being uh, one of them with uh, the number and, and all kinds, car industry, cigarette industry. So most of the great big advertising uh, uh, begins at this period after, uh, in the 1920s and World War I. And the two, uh, government and during this period, I think this is almost, I don't, I would say golden age, except for it's something I think is in some ways terrible. Um, but there's a golden age here where the government and um, uh, industry, in a sense, are learning from each other as to how do you best harvest human attention. What are the basic techniques for reaching millions of people and putting either an image or something in there uh, and getting them to process it? One of the great uh, techniques, which ultimately the Americans uh, come up with in this is the invention that we now call prime time. Um, the, uh, these are the very first um, broadcast stars in American history. This was, uh, they had a show, uh, Amos and Andy. Um, and in its time, this uh, show, Amos and Andy, had, uh, they didn't keep ratings very carefully back then, but its ratings exceed any, any contemporary program by a factor of, uh, of 10. They would regularly get audiences of 20 to 30 million people every day, 7 p.m., for 15 minutes to listen to the latest adventures of Amos and Andy, who, as you probably can tell, were two uh, white fellows who, uh, they didn't, on the radio, I think, actually paint themselves uh, black, but they talked with uh, what sounded like a black, uh, black voices, and they had adventures. Um, but the really important thing in this process was the development of a ritual or of a habit whereby an entire population of a country would, on a regular, indeed daily basis, be expected to or understand that what they thought they would do is sit down every day and be, expose themselves to uh, advertising and entertainment um, for some period of time, prime time. When you think about it, you know, we, many of us grew up with uh, prime time, so think it's normal. I think it's one of the craziest things in human history, and in fact, completely unprecedented, to have an entire nation listening to the same information uh, roughly at the same time uh, nearly every day. The only real possible comparison is with religious services. In, earliest, uh, in earlier areas. And I don't, have, I don't know if they learn uh, uh, directly, but the only, it is, I think, an astonishing feature of the 20th century, and one which we, we may never ever see again, in fact, that you have that much, with, with rare exceptions, like a, a speech or, or so forth, or the ending of a, of a show. So uh, this, is, uh, th this was uh, prime time. And I wanted to point out actually something that maybe not everyone knows, that the early radio in America, radio and TV shows, were all created by advertisers. In other words, they were advertising. Well, they were designed to keep people there so there was enough advertising, but often they were kind of more like we consider infomercials. Uh, in this time also, in the 1930s, you have the invention of the first, this was the, 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 the prime time um, 
so evening family uh, entertainment. You also have during this period the invention of the soap opera, which is the first entertainment directly aimed at women audiences, who through the entire history of this period uh, are, are critical as, uh, as family decision makers. Uh, much of the history of advertising in particular is how do you get the attention of women? What is it? And the soap opera is this sort of major idea of uh, how, how you uh, do just that. And along the way, soap opera, they were, of course, written by um, uh, Ivory Soap or other household uh, companies, not only soap makers, but P&G, as ways to sort of, um, uh, the, the word was entertainment that sells, a form of advertisement that would keep people watching over and over and over again. Um, so uh, I was said there's a, a sort of an interaction between government and um, an industry uh, that goes back and forth. And the sort of culmination of this early period of ancient harvesting is clearly in the totalitarian states uh, in the 1930s, 1940s. So uh, here's one of the, the classic. Oh, I just want to go. Here's the image of prime time, I suppose. We have the family uh, see the sitting at the radio. Um, all together and every day taking their dose of advertising entertainment. This is a 20th century thing. Um, so really it's the Third Reich that takes it to its ultimate extreme. So one of the interesting things that the Third Reich did is they took the concept of prime time and they made it into a state program whereby you would have, obviously the radio was one run by, by the, uh, the government, where the propaganda ministry uh, would program uh, content that um, citizens would listen to. And, and on special occasions, all citizens, uh, uh, moments of the nation they were called, the entire citizenry would, would uh, be in a sense compelled to sit and listen to a message uh, in a special listening hall and with radio wardens and loudspeakers. So the whole country, uh, I, I would say that the, the Third Reich took the uh, sort of the best techniques from the United States, combined them with fascist uh, scale and, 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 and uh, created a program. Uh, Albert Spears said this at his trial. He said, by using the, the greatest uh, of technologies, we were able to have 80 million people listening to a single man whenever we wanted. And that was the key to the entire German system. So that's, um, uh, I, I guess, in World War II, you reach almost a peak attention situation. So the next part of the book, um, uh, is the story of the, the backlash. And after World War II, you see a number of methods where tech companies, uh, uh, industry, starts to move in a different uh, direction. And here's an important invention in that regard. This is an early version of the remote control, um, which you can see used to be sort of shaped like a gun, uh, <laughs> pioneered by Zenith. Zenith is an interesting maverick company of its time the owner of whom uh, uh, hated advertising. And one of his idea of the remote control and of Zenith in general was to try to, he didn't phrase it this way, but when you think about it conceptually, if we think of the, the, the uh, pre-World War II period as the maximum almost of an approach whereby you have centralized control over what the population pays attention to, with a very limited number of networks, uh, this idea of prime time, programming done by um, uh, some centralized entity. This uh, remote control is a very minor, maybe kind of trivial seeming invention, but beginning of a, a backlash, a beginning of the sense that uh, customers, individuals, want to decide what, again, what they're going to spend their attention with. They want to be able to be in control uh, of the television. Another important invention in this period um, that follows the exact same uh, philosophy, uh, is this the early version of the modern computer interface. This is a Doug Douglas Engelbart, for those of you who are um, heavy computer into computer history. Uh, this is an early, early version of uh, the computer interface. And the computer interface is radical in a, in a number of ways, some of which well known, but also from an intentional standpoint. Uh, the idea that the screen is responding to the individual, when you think about that, it was really un unprecedented. I mean, if you movie theater, you don't control what happens in the movie. Uh, TV, you just sit there and absorb it. Radio, the same. Um, the idea that the screen is responding to what you do, uh, and also that everyone has a screen. This gentleman has two screens, it looks like, um, was a, a, an astonishing an idea. And even though we now have in our 
probably some of you have screens in front of you, and some, all of us uh, have at least one or maybe more screens. The idea that we'd have our own screens, um, I think, is, is quite a radical one that it, are under our control and which we pay our attention to. As I'll, as I'll suggest, they later end up enslaving us, so that's a different. <laughs> every, every. So we have a general sense of backlash, and what I'll suggest is that even as there is this backlash, people moving uh, cable, television, the United States is another thing where it's uh, supposed to give you more choice. We then have the invention of new and more powerful attention gaining techniques uh, in the 1970s and 80s. One of the things that comes to birth in the 70s is this uh, big innovation, uh, the celebrity, uh, the use of celebrity as nothing more than a tool for attention. At some point, uh, the people in the magazine industry, who had always sort of pretended to talk about somewhat serious topics, realized um, that the power of celebrities to hold human attention is really almost magical. And I've been trying to actually understand the liter you know, reading various types of literature as to why celebrities have such an astonishing power to grab uh, attention. It is interesting. You know, you imagine a story about uh, orphans in Africa, and people, you know, I'll read, maybe I'll read that later, it seems. But suddenly, you know, Madonna adopts a baby or something, and it's like, no one can get enough of the story. So what, you know, what just is it? And I, it's a very strange uh, thing. I've been reading a little bit, and I can talk about it more. Uh, some uh, people believe that we actually believe we're we, we know them, that we're related to the para, they were parasocial relations. You actually think you have a relationship with, with a celebrity, and therefore you uh, see them almost like as a family member or something, or as a friend, and you are interested in what happens to them. There's other people, uh, there's a scholar here, maybe at Oxford or somewhere in England, um, anyway, I forget his name, um, who, uh, you know, people who believe this different form of religion, they're sort of demigods that we worship one way or another in the same way, you know, ancient uh, Greeks would uh, recognize them. Anyway, so this, this industry comes into, in, into birth, and it has really uh, started to dominate. I mean, there's... Uh, in the United States, it is unusual now, even for fashion magazines, to not have celebrities on the cover. They have to, you know, everything, and so much of reporting, and, you know, I do some journalism on the side, uh, you know, the link to a, a, some type of celebrity, even a, a, you know, an author or something, uh, makes the story a story. You know, it's become sort of the crucial ingredient to, to so much uh, that people do. So another invention in this time uh, that comes, I alluded to earlier, is the beginnings of video games, which are um, very precisely tailored and ultimately very good at uh, seizing and grabbing human attention for long periods of time. Um, back in the days when they cost uh, money to put in, they, they wanted you to <laughs> spend a little bit of time but then come back. Uh, today they're engineered to try to uh, very sophisticated methods to try to hook people and keep them uh, uh, playing the game longer and longer. And it's, uh, I've played some of the games, you know, sort of for research and have friends who do. <laughs> and, you know, it's amazing. You will look up and five hours have gone by and how that happens. Very sophisticated uh, uh, manipulation of the attention facilities in these, uh, in, in these projects. So this takes us more or less to our present time, which I won't spend uh, too much time on. I think I've um, uh, said about enough. Um, with the birth of the internet and with mobile devices and moving towards uh, wearable, that's just an old Google site, old uh, wearable uh, and the, uh, I, I'm pleased to talk about wearable devices at all. I think that what we've seen is an increasing um, sophistication, well, two things at once. First of all, a user or a, a customer, or a citizenry that is, um, first of all, somewhat distracted and hard to, to pin down. You don't have this uh, prime time assumption anymore where people will be in front of their televisions or be at church on Sunday or something where you have people. So uh, those who want to harvest attention have to, in a sense, chase them. But their techniques of chasing them, uh, they have some advantages now because we all carry around phones or computers and so forth. And so um, they're, they're the concept of a private space where people don't pay attention to anything other than maybe their family or something is, is uh, much dissipated. So the, 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 the um, attention harvesters uh, of today um, have some disadvantages, but have also learned some uh, uh, new techniques, which I'm happy to uh, talk about. Let me just uh, close with a few um, 
ideas for what this all means. Um, I think that we uh, should take seriously the idea of human attention as one of the last uh, scarce resources. I think um, at three uh, levels. I think that um, um, uh, as a society or um, it, uh, through government, we should be cognizant of trying to sometimes protect the value of human attention to realize it can be frittered away and, and lost. Whether this means businesses designing, redesigning their offices so that people have more space to, to, do, to do work and close, you know, have actual closed offices or uh, whatever this means. There's a lot of uh, ways in which I think we would do things differently. I think government can uh, protect people from uh, some of the really unwarranted grabs. I don't think they should go too far. But there's certain things where I think there are lines that are crossed. I'll give an example. I, I'm sometimes on airplanes, and suddenly I have advertisements playing right in front of your face and, um, that, are, that are loud, uh, you know, that are actual volume advertisements. And there's no way, if you know anything about neuroscience, you can ignore these. You know, they, they do grab your attention. They do use up some of your resources. And I was like, I don't think I paid for this when I, you know, <laughs> maybe if I, it's one thing if you agree to watch advertisements to watch a show, but it's sort of an uncompensated transfer. I think this is um, sometimes something government needs to think about. Almost uh, one day, it'll seem like secondhand smoke. And the third thing, I guess my message is to individuals, or just all of us, uh, which is to uh, think of your, and maybe you already do, but think of your attention as a very valuable resource, something you choose to spend, and uh, understand if it's not spent wisely, it will drift away and be gone. Anyway, thank you very much, and I'll be pleased to take questions. <laughs>